This is gonna get heavier and darker for a little bit until it gets better, just bear with me. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you know who this is. Liechtenstein is a big banking empire. And kind of they funded a lot of Adolf Hitler's work. And um, uh, the crown prince is their king. So this is a man that I've met with and um, known for a number of years. I think this is dated 1994. Um, and Hans Adam von Liechtenstein, um, the first time I called, the, I was asked to call the, the castle, uh, his butler or someone picked up and then he was immediately put on and we talked and he says well I don't want to talk on the phone too much but we should meet and these letters this and the you can go to the next one also um, uh, it was a maybe a few, few a month later or something um, it was from the castle Vaduz um, and this is the actual letters um, he's, and he, he basically said to me, you know, let's get together. And I think he, I, he was wanting me to come to Europe. And I said, well, I'm too busy. I'm working as a doctor. And, um, and then it, it ended up, and although it's not reflected in this letter, he came to New York and stayed at the Four Seasons um, Hotel there in uh, Central Park. And um, so he invited me over, and I had a meeting with him. But he says, from what I know of your assessment, your assessment is correct about the group, this cabal which is controlling the issue we discussed, UFO. I suspect they have very good reasons not to inform the public, and therefore I am highly skeptical about your chances of success, but he still wanted to meet. So <laughs> I said, okay, let's meet. So this is where it's gonna get into some shock and awe. I'm going 94 in July. I go up and meet with him at the Pierre Hotel, Four Seasons, and the reason he didn't think it could succeed is that he told me the ETs wouldn't allow it. He wouldn't allow, they wouldn't allow disclosure to happen. I said, excuse me, we're making contact and it's clear that, you know. Um, he said, well, let me tell you what happened. So he was involved with a lot of UN programs and also with uh, George H.W. Bush, the first President Bush and a man at the UN named Perez de Cuellar, who was the Secretary General at the time. I had done briefings with uh, the predecessor, the, um, uh, with the one after Boutrous Boutrous Ghali. And he said to me, the reason I on the phone told you that it wouldn't be allowed, isn't that it wouldn't be allowed from the point of view of the government, but the aliens won't allow it. I said, well, that's ridiculous. I mean, since we've been talking, we've gone down to Mexico, had craft come out. I said, they're obviously wanting to make contact if we do it in a peaceful way and not a military way. He says, well, this was attempted before you started your organization. I said, what are you talking about? He says, well, in November of 1989, in the fall of 1989, President Ronald Reagan, Mikhail Gorbachev, Perez de Cuellar, and himself, this guy and others met with on a committee, very sensitive and classified, to organize basically what I did with the Disclosure Project, to announce that we weren't alone and end the secrecy. And he said what happened is that Perez de Cuellar, the Secretary General of the United Nations, was coming back from a 3 a.m. late nine pl planning session for this event. When he was abducted, by aliens from his motorcade in Manhattan. And I said, oh really? And he proceeded to tell me the gory details of what happened. So Perez de Cuellar was taken somehow out of the motorcade onto an ET craft where he was threatened by the ETs and told, if you disclose this information, we will abduct every world leader involved, including the President of the United States. Now this is from a person who was at the table for this planning session, to my ears, now to you. And I went, oh, come on, really? And he said, yeah, it blew up like an atomic bomb in the Bush White House. Subsequently, I found out that up at Kennedy Bunkport, there were all these UFOs zipping around when uh, Bush was up there out on his cigarette boat. And they didn't realize they were ours. So now we're getting into false flag 101. 
up to and including being able to deceive members of magic. And it took me a long time to get to the bottom of this mystery. Now, people like Bud Hopkins thought it was a real abduction case. And I looked into it, and I found out that if you go back to the Roswell event, there was a red-headed sergeant who was the badass guy who threatened to kill everyone, all those ranchers who saw this thing crash. His son became a part of magic security, this renegade group, this splinter group, who was involved with abductions and stopping leaks within magic itself. They, he then went and was in the security detail that night and set up the electronics for this electronic warfare abduction of aliens. It was all a hoax. It wasn't ET at all. It was 100% military ops. And so when, we're going to get into this in a moment, well, how these operate. And so Paris de Cuellar, of course, not knowing about that end of the classified world, and I would say Papa Bush neither, thought it was actually E.T. And it blew up, as I said, like an atomic bomb in the Bush White House and Gorbachev. They pulled the plug on the plans to do disclosure and end secrecy in 1989 at the end of the Cold War. And I think it's strange that in January of 90, two months later, it's when I had a contact event at my house in North Carolina with an ET and with a, that said basically pick up what you've dropped, do this, what you, what you left and behind as a teenager, pick this up again, someone's got to pick this up. But maybe that's a coincidence, but Paris de Cuellar thought that that was an actual alien abduction. And I had that, I said, well, with your highness, with all due respect, there are technologies that would facilitate this kind of deception and the military term, so you know it, is a false INW, or a deceptive INW, indication and warning. And it's basically like the you know, Gulf of Tonkin event in Vietnam. You basically exaggerate or hoax an event that then man manipulates policymakers. So this was the ultimate takedown of official disclosure, which was about to happen in 1989. Got it? 26 years ago, November 1989. So here we are in 2015, and it took a lot to piece all this together, and I began to, to, to look into what the electronics were uh, with this and all what kind of technologies they might have. And uh, one bit of insight that print, the Prince had, he said, you know, so he told me that the reason he was funding the abduction groups, is that he was convinced that there was an existential threat from outer space. That's been the Sub Rosa plan since the 56. And that he wanted people to hate the aliens enough to pay the blood and treasure of World War III. And he also wanted it to be eschatological, where it would result in the end of the world so that Christ would return and the good folks would go up in a flying saucer, I guess, with Christ. Now, this is what he was telling me. I'm just listening. And I'm going, whoa, this is like, whoo-hoo. Um, and he was completely convinced that this is what needed to happen. This sort of end of the world, eschatological, eschatology is the study of the end of the world event. And that's why he was putting so much money in and providing so much funding to uh, Mac and David Jacobs and you know, Bud Hopkins and all this. And he eventually, he told me, he says, I'm going to stop funding John Mack because he's become too positive about contact. And I, I only want to fund people who are going to put things out there that scare people and make them hate the aliens. He said this. So I went, oh boy, now this, this is connecting a dot that all of you better listen to very carefully. If it's the last thing you learn today. And that is that there is an overarching agenda that was hatched in the 50s. Remember that psychological warfare document and its value that was hatched in 50, between 53 and 56 to create the specter of a threat from outer space that does not exist. Werner von Braun stated on his deathbed and we have the testimony of his assistant that he, and, and, and said, they will first have the Cold War, 
Then we decided there would be nations of concern, then global terrorism. We have this testimony from before 9-11. Then that would be followed by threats from outer space. They'll start talking about asteroids and things of this sort, but the ultimate one they're gonna play is the alien threat and it's all a lie and it's all a hoax. But in order for the lie to work, they have had to create a body of disinformation, false information, and frightening scenarios and actual events that would be convincing to our policymakers like Reagan, convincing to the average person and to the UFO public that consumes videos, entertainment consoles, movies, etc. And that has been the 50 to 60 year plan. Don't forget that no less a figure than Douglas MacArthur in his last address to the Congress said World War III will be interplanetary. So they have been wanting to provoke an interplanetary conflict for as long as I've been alive, and I'm no spring chicken. And, all right, so this gets into a huge problem of how people consume information and can be manipulated through fear. Because if you look at the roots of human uh, warfare, the early days, and even today, it's people abducting people, a tribe's women, raping them, abusing them sexually, et cetera, and so on. This is all stuff that they are simulating and saying that the ETs are doing through these abduction scenarios. It is 100% being done by military special operations that are this paramilitary force. Um, and this is the deep end of the pond. Now, when I discovered this back in 1994, now this is 21 years on, I was told by someone in the intelligence community, don't talk about that because that's what's really dangerous for you. And it's also what will discredit you and it will also cause them to hate you the most because you're defanging their whole war plan. The next big war is not terrorism, it's interstellar. And if you expose that it's a hoax, it takes all the steam out of their plan. I said, yes, but if we don't, we're cooked because there's no way you can have war that's interstellar and survive it. It'd be worse than mutual assured destruction because the technologies are you know, a thousand times worse than a hydrogen bomb. So I said, look, we're gonna have to figure out how to deal with this. And it, the only way I know how to do it is put the sunlight in there and let people know what the truth is. So a man came along, if you go to the next slide, um, And you probably have seen this, it's up on our website. Uh, when we first put it up, it had over 600,000 views. The next day, uh, the intelligence community went in and said there were 6,000 views. By the way, if you believe the metrics on Google and YouTube, I have a bridge to sell you. It's, it's all can be manipulated because it moves you down the search engines. So when this hit, within a couple of days, had 600,000 views. This man, William Pollock, his name is pronounced Pollock, uh, it was a man, very good man, who gave me an interview only to be released posthumously after he died. And not long ago, a few years ago, I got a letter from his wife, significant other, I guess, they weren't technically married, uh, and with a, a death certificate and a letter giving me permission. And he had, passed away. he had passed away. And I have a lot of these, you know, and I honor my word about keeping a confidence. So what happened is that he gave me this interview and in it he talks about the development of RF radio frequency chip implants back in the 70s and 80s. And this, it, when he was developed, it was, it was totally an accidental thing that happened. He was with a company that developed it. it he then got called into the CIA and they started doing special programs for the CIA to develop it, and at a certain point, Siemens in Silicon Valley manufactured two billion of them, with a B, of these RF chips. And the way they work, I mean, they can be so miniaturized, you could eat something with it, it has a radio free, and it can transmit not only where you are, but the really advanced ones have a neurophone capability to control thought and behavior. Very sinister stuff. 
Um, so you can actually do a lot of psychological warfare with these RF frequency chips. Uh, now that was the early stages in the 70s and 80s. Now you figure, you know, 40 years later, they're more and more and more and more sophisticated. And as I've watched the whole UFO subculture sort of get involved with this whole fascination with abductions and, and implants, I went, yeah, but you know EG&G is on the, one of the plants is on the edge of the Area 51? They're the ones manufacturing the implants that you're taking out of these abduction victims. Absolutely. They're not coming from outer space. They don't need that. If you're interstellar, you're transdimensional. If you're transdimensional, you don't need an RF frequency plant chip to track anybody because their technologies are way beyond that. I said, this is human, 100%. And you better wake up. And so Powlett gave us this interview, and it was one of a dozen data points that I began to accumulate. And then not many years ago, I get a document, the next one, which is chilling has never been shown. It's from the Strategic Studies Institute, think tank, and it's dated 1995. And it was talking about all kinds of global security strategies. And you know, you can look at it yourself, cult programmed graduates, blah, 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 who will be expected to participate in contrived UFO abduction scenarios. Listen carefully. Oh, we need the next one up. Um, Strategic Studies Institute. Is it? I can't see the screen. Is it up? All right. So I loathe reading to people because, but this, I will. <laughs> and number two, create a global UFO cult which will involve, this, this is what needs to be done in order to actuate this false flag operation, that will involve the abduction of citizens so as to foster an illusion that this earth is facing an extraterrestrial invasion. UFO abductees of preference will have an experience in computer technologies since that expertise will be required in future technocratic RMA scenarios. Use of experimental drugs, holographic projection capabilities, directed energy technologies, I'll get into that in a moment, induced auditory input. These are the neurophones I mentioned that Werner von Braun said the most dangerous thing is the neurophone, non-local things that can be done to, to make people think they're having an experience when they're not. Um, input, experimental aircraft, well, that's just a euphemism for man-made UFOs, and special effects costuming and stagecraft, among other things, will be used to persuade the abductees of the reality of their circumstances. Official denials regarding these events will employ reverse psychology to ensure that all such denials are taken as official confirmation of an imminent and or ongoing extraterrestrial invasion. This is the next page. UFO abductees will be persuaded to worship their anticipated ET conquerors in cult-enforced religious fashion. UFO cult networks will be controlled by U.S. intelligence to limit infiltration and ensure that dissidents do not disrupt UFO long-term long agendas. Uncontrollable dissidents will be assassinated, preferably by directed energy means. Dissociative satanic cult graduates will handle all such executions, i.e., when not actively lending logical and theatrical support to UFO abduction operations. Number three, directed energy surveillance and weapons technology of all types and caps will be used for purposes of spreading fear and confusion in the population at large under deniable circumstances for eliminating persons deemed adversarial to U.S. national security interests and for spotting, assessing, and manipulating potential re recruits to the RMA cause. Neurocybernetics and other psychotechnologies will be used to sow confusion and hypochondria 
in the population. The symptoms and effects produced by these and other directed energy technologies will parallel the effects produced by various microbes, viruses, and chemical imbalances, thus compelling a large segment of society to seek medical intervention, which in turn will be a basis for their being used for medical experimentation under voluntary circumstances. Psychiatrists and psychologists will play an important role in these experiments, particularly where denying the efficacy of neuro cybernetics psychotechnologies is concerned. Com citizens who complain of hearing voices will be used as a basis for generously government-funded schizophrenic-related brain research, on and on and on. It goes on. Now, if you're not falling out of your chair yet, what I want to tell you is that all of that has come to pass and came to pass between the 1950s and the 1970s. A man that I worked with before his death had developed a, an electronic system in 1956 or 54, 54, that would enable someone electronically to remote view anywhere and could also affect, uh, these, some of these have been called radionic psychotronic weapon systems. And they were developed decades ago. Now, how hard is it to deploy them? Not hard. And they're not used every day. They're used enough to create a groundswell of conviction that there's an alien threat. So you take that capability, combine it with man-made UFOs, combine it with disinformation in general about the subject, and also certain chemicals, and you can launch an entire contagion of fear that's based on completely man-made false events. So this is the false flag event I wanted to warn you about. It, and people say, when is that gonna happen? I said, it's happened already. It's already happened. The media, the film industry, any UFO conference you go to is going to be filled unwittingly usually, not always unwittingly, but usually with information that is this kind of disinformation designed to create an us versus them dynamic of an alien threat. And the reason for it is that that is the only way to grow the military industrial complex. You know, Leon Panetta, the CI director and then Secretary of Defense, but when he was CI director said, you know, we're spending a $110 billion a year chasing down 70 Al Qaeda members in Afghanistan. Ridiculous. Um, and in order to sustain the level of expenditures and grow the military, industrial, intelligence, laboratory, financial complex, you got to have another enemy. And as terrible as the terrorism threat is, and it's real, it's nothing compared to what they could do like in the movie Independence Day, where they stage an attack using man-made anti-grabs that look very ET with this kind of technology that there is a threat or an attack on Earth. So heads up, Werner von Braun on his deathbed warned that this would happen and it would be hoaxed. We've had so many people, I have met with one man, I can't get him to come forward, and then another, and then another, and then another, who spoke of in the early days, they used, I know this sounds terrible, but he was a little guy, and it was a little, he was so short, and they basically did like you would in a movie, suit and head and mat to make him look like an alien. And he would be, there would be military choppers nearby, but he would be on one of these flying discs, man-made, and go in and with a chemical canister and some electronics, abduct people. And he says, oh yeah, I was on an abduction squad. It was way back, I think in the 60s. They've gotten better, and I say better, and they've become more efficient because over the decades, they've developed little creatures that look like an ET. They may look gray or like a reptile or this. And they actually, they kind of walk like this. They have this robotic weird walk. And if, if you look at the... Uh, I saw the video that Stan Romanek had of the one that came into his house that, that basically a film company bought up in Black Shell. Nobody has seen this. I was at his home. And the one that came into his house was exactly one of these so-called gray-like creatures. And the way it moved was this very robotic, it was so obvious that it was a bio-machine. 
And if you go into the brain, it, it is physical. It has a biological component, but the, it's laced, the, the neural cortex is laced with integrated circuits. And it's completely under control of these military operatives. But he thought it was an alien. I said, well, it was an alien, but not an ET. So I used the word alien, which is, has a very xenophobic ring, to connote the man-made ones, and the ETs are the ones that are interstellar. The aliens that are man-made are ones that are completely under the control of these paramilitary operations. And the stagecraft, if you use the language of this Strategic Studies Institute document, is so good that it would fool anyone. The president, the CIA, you could abduct, and they did. They abducted Paris de Quayar out of his limousine using this stuff, and he thought it was E.T. And that's why they killed the initial plan to end secrecy at the end of the Cold War. Gorbachev was on board, Reagan was on board, Paris de Cuellar, head of the UN, Prince of Liechtenstein was involved, et cetera, and so on. Killed it. Now, now we're getting, this I know is where everyone's going, can this man have lost his mind? Every word I'm telling you is true. This is the heart of the secrecy. How do you convince people there's another species to hate? 